So thank you very much for this very nice introduction and uh, welcome. Um, yes, I have known Glenn since more than 25 years. And during that time, of course, we had a lot of discussions on uh, many topics in instrumentation, uh, but not only instrumentation, also related issues. And since a couple of years, I was happy also to learn uh, Gladys. We visited them a few times. And um, yeah, it was always a pleasure for me to go ahead with him because he was acting as, a, as an advisor, as a wise man, as we would say in Europe. So we had no contractual relationships, but we had a lot of ties to discuss things in a very open and honest way. So and that was the uh, strength of Glenn to hear, understand, and finally make a comment which may have had uh, a couple of consequences. OK, so I was uh, starting with that movie, which is a, a measurement which we did uh, about five years ago at Slack at the linear coherent light source. I will come to the physics and of the measurement of that uh, in a while. Uh, that is just to show you the beauty, the symmetry, and also the fun which is associated of developing instrumentation and what that finally may give to us in terms of knowledge and uh, progress in uh, science, but also in practical areas like um, uh, medical, biological, and drag, uh, drug uh, developments. So my program is confined in, in this, talk, in this uh, slide over here. So if you understand the background of your instrument, you can do much better than what the uh, measured quantity in a very first view shows to you. Uh, it shows on how you can improve, for example, the positional resolution of an instrument and the energy resolution of an instrument. And the whole, uh, let's say, context of that may lead to uh, insight into matter and into biological tissues, which are far beyond just measuring the ampl amplitude of a signal. Um, yeah, we had a lot of meetings, joint meetings, and you may know that in Europe we like castles, and some of those are shown here. This is Schloss Elmau, where in 2015 the G7 summit was occurring, so all the wealthy people all over the world came together there, and Glenn, uh, Glenn and I were there already in 2002, so that shows a little bit uh, on how far we have been ahead of time. So uh, we have had many meetings together, and Glenn was uh, always in the advisory committee of our meetings, and he was giving a lot of advice uh, for structuring and um, uh, leading the, the, the meetings. So here you see a few of the people who have attended the conference. Uh, Glenn here is surrounded by Pavel Rehak, a famous physicist, Pierfranco Manfredi, Gerhard Lutz, Chris Damerel, and, and others. And uh, yeah, it was always a very nice place where we were staying for about a week without any uh, fancy connections to the outside world through internet or so. So we had time to discuss and really go deep in, in our exchanges. This is another picture almost 15 years ago, uh, very close to the area where Barack Obama and Angela Merkel were uh, uh, walking around. So that is uh, in the garden of Schloss Elmau. OK, so my talk will be focused on the uh, measurement and interaction of X-ray and particles uh, with uh, semiconductor detectors, and I will first outline the event generation of X-rays and uh, electrons, for example, in semiconductor detectors, how the signal charge cloud evolves, and how we can simulate the physical processes in order to understand exactly what happens inside to get to a very firm interpretation of the experimental results. Uh, all of what I will explain you in the very beginning will be experimentally verified uh, with uh, techniques I'm going to explain to later on. And then we will go through a variety of applications and then you will see on how deep the development of instrumentation can go. 
So uh, at the very end, uh, you will then see uh, the, uh, let's say, state-of-the-art detection of X-rays up to a given energy, which is beyond the energy you are exploring here at Michigan University. Um, and electrons in uh, electron microscopy. Now, every type of ionizing radiation has a specific signature. For example, protons, they have a Z of one. If they have energies below, let's say, one MeV, they lead to a track associated with electron hole pairs, which are created along the path. From time to time, there is a head-on collision with an electron, which we then call a delta electron. And at the end of the track, you have a very intense ionization, which is nicely described by the formulas of beta and Bloch. Part, uh, alpha particles uh, have a different signature. Uh, even at en energies above, let's say, 5 or 6, 7 MeV, they dissipate their energy in a pretty small volume, generating a plasma of electron hole pairs, which then finally develops and expands and moves to the collecting node. Minimum ionizing particles uh, deliver a completely different signature. So, the definition of a minimum ionizing particle is that the loss of energy in the detector is much less than the total kinetic energy of the particle itself. So if you have a high energy particle, it goes straight through, typically produces 80 electron hole pair per micron track length in the silicon. And from time to time, again, there is a head-on collision with an electron, which gives rise to that delta electron. Now, electrons of moderate energies, let's say below 500 keV, they suffer elastic and inelastic scattering, so changing their direction and losing energy, and depositing as well uh, a track of ionizing uh, electron, of ionizing uh, mechanisms resulting in electron hole pairs along the track. Optical photons, they just make in the wavelength range of 400 nanometer up to 1200 nanometer, one electron hole pair, and the location of the interaction is depending on the wavelengths. So the very short wavelengths do it pretty soon after they enter the silicon. The infrared wavelength of one uh, uh, millimeter wavelength, uh, they have the chance to go through the entire silicon and eventually uh, deposit their energy in a, in a depth of 500 micron. X-rays, they are again very special. They don't interact while they penetrate into the silicon, but at a given moment, they produce a photoelectric effect. That means that they eject a K-shell electron from the silicon, which then ionizes the neighboring uh, silicon atoms and a very tiny charge cloud is developing uh, in uh, volume less than a cubic micron. And then this charge cloud moves towards the site which is able to sense the amount of uh, electrons. And while it's moving, it may expand due to electrostatic repulsion and through diffusion. Now, part one is imaging and spectroscopy with X-rays in the energy range of 100 eV up to 20 keV. The background image is a shot which we took at the linear coherent light source in, uh, in Stanford. Uh, the experiment will be explained a little bit deeper later on. All of the measurements I'm going to show you have been done with a silicon detector, uh, which we call a PN type CCD, a PN CCD. Uh, that's why I'm introducing it a little bit more in detail so that you can understand better the boundary conditions of the measurements. Now, the PN junction CCD consists only of reverse biased diode structure, which makes it intrinsically radiation hard. It's based on the concept developed by Emilio Gatti and Pavel Rehak uh, on the principle of sideward depletion. That means that an ohmic contact, these are the green dots over here, in the very beginning are connected to a non-depleted n-type silicon bulk. Now, if you cover the top surface and the back surface with a rectifying junction and apply a potential which uh, 
depletes the silicon, then the depletion zone starts from the front side and from the back side uh, in such a way that at a given moment the depletion zones touch in the middle of the wafer. If you apply additional negative potential to the back side, you can shift the potential minimum for electrons close to the side having this strip type structure. And if you apply the right voltages to the strips, you can create local potential minima for electrons where you can store them and if you change the potentials in time, you can discreetly drift them towards a read node which has an on-chip integrated JFET amplifier and where every column is then connected to an ASIC amplifier. This plot over here shows the potential inside the CCD. So you have the rectifying junction on the back side, that is this uniform entrance window over here, biased to a negative potential, in this case uh, to minus 120 volts. You see the parabolic type potential over here. So charges created here through ionizing radiation uh, move in the following way. The electrons move down to the most positive potential, so the minus potential is plotted. The holes are absorbed in the back contact and they don't, do not contribute in this case to the signal. So the electrons are collected in the potential minima and if you change those registers in time, you can discreetly transfer the signal charges to a read node where they can be detected with very high precision because we can make the anode capacitance so small. So that movie shows on how that works in uh, internally. So let's assume that we have created a charge cloud of 1,500 electrons. And if that charge cloud is finally reaching the potential minimum of the detector close to the pixel structure, you can see on how the movement of the registers uh, form a potential well, where if the charge would sit here, it would always see a drifting potential so that it is smoothly transferred to a read node. That is the easy way on how a CCD type detector works. Now, if you would sit inside such a CCD, you would have the following point of view. So radiation comes in from the back side. You have the conversion through the photoelectric effect. You have a very compact charge cloud in the very beginning, uh, which is widening with time through repulsion and diffusion. And as soon as they move towards the side having the pixel structure, they have a certain radius and they may cover an area uh, which is larger than the size of a pixel. So not all of the charges will be collected in one single pixel. If the pixel size and if the drift time and the other parameters are chosen in the right way, you will have always charges which are, uh, let's say, reaching more than one pixel. If that happens, and if your read noise is low enough, you will see later on that this contributes enormously to the improvement of the position resolution. Now, uh, this is the simulation of the charge cloud approaching the back side. You see the uh, separating register and how the charge is then going to the right and the left pixel. This is the electron density, and if you look very precisely, the amplitude is going down, but the width is growing because it's expanding, and now you can really see on how they reach the potential minimum, and the fancy structure of the electron distribution would show you, if you would be a clever person, uh, on how the implantations in the collecting areas are made. You can see those things. Uh, now reaching uh, the pixels and the charges have been well divided in, in the two pixels. Those simulations have been made for many different energies and uh, locations of conversion. Now, let's get back to the situation which I explained before. Let's assume that this kind of charge cloud is reaching the pixel structure and it may fill uh, an area as shown here, so a lot of charge in here a little less here and here, and a little bit in, in one of these pixels. Now, if you would take those four pixels and would form the center of mass of that charge cloud distribution, assuming that this was a flat disk arriving on that uh, structure, you would already find a centroid which is better in position resolution than simply saying, okay, I set a threshold at uh, 50% and I say, okay, the charge was hitting only that pixel. 
So then the pixel coordinate would be the center of that pixel, but which is not true. It was displaced by a little bit. Now, this already improves the position resolution tremendously, but it's still it's based on a wrong assumption. It's not a flat disk which is arriving and which is depositing the charge in such a way in the pixel structure. It has a Gaussian profile, and the Gaussian profile uh, is very well defined. And the width of the profile uh, can be calculated and measured very precisely. Now, if you assume that you have a Gaussian profile, then you would find a different centroid in this pixel because the amount of charge which was his hitting this pixel, which in the analysis would then be transferred to the center, uh, uniformly distributed in this pixel, would deform uh, uh, the reconstruction of the position of incidence. And that is shown in the following simulation. If this is the pixel size, in this case 48 micron, and if you would go with a very uh, well-defined laser beam across the pixel along that black line, the center of gravity method would give you a reconstruction shown here. So it, the straight line would be deformed due to, to the effects which I explained before. The same is true for uh, this kind of track. If you apply uh, the Gauss correction instead of the simple center of gravity method, then you can reconstruct the track pretty precisely. You increase the error a little bit in this area over here, which is easy to understand, because the, the closer you are in the center of a pixel, the less is the charge going to the neighboring pixels. And if the noise is mixed with the few electrons which are collected in the neighboring pixels, the precision of determination of the charge in the neighboring pixels is less. So you add uncertainty if the particle or if the point of interaction was pretty much in the center of a pixel. Now, if you plot the position precision in a pixel, which can be simulated by Monte Carlo simulations, which we did, uh, you will find that in a pixel of a size of 48 by 48 microns, uh, and if you assume an X-ray energy of 1.3 keV, uh, the position resolution is worse in the center of a pixel of the order of 3 microns, and it improves towards the edges which is easy to understand because then you have a similar amount of charge in both pixels which have a decent amount and which can be nicely resolved with the noise of the order of three electrons RMS which we had in our measurements. Now, we need to, to experimentally verify that statement. And that was done in the following way. So we took the CCD which I described before, in this case it was a three centimeter long CCD, 1.5 centimeter in the other direction, had a pixel size of 48 by 48 microns. The number of pixels in the imaging area was 264 by 264, and it was read out with 1,000 frames at pictures per second and a read noise of 3.5 electrons. Now, if you would, and you will see that we reach a position precision with uh, this uh, CCD of the order of three microns. If you would like to achieve the same position precision by making the pixels smaller, you would have a CCD with 5,000 by 5,000 pixels, which you need to read out 1,000 frames a second, and that would lead to 50 gigabyte of data per second which is an enormous amount of data. If you can get the same position precision by applying a clever algorithm uh, and reducing the amount of data by the order of a factor of 1,000, of course, then you are much better off. So uh, those high precision measurements need to be, um, uh, to be developed for experiments like uh, resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, X-ray diffraction, X-ray astronomy, and so on. Now, the readout is made in the following way. So we have a center part, which we call imaging area. Charges and images are collected there. Then we operate it in a split frame operation. So we shift very rapidly the content of the imaging area to a so-called frame store area or parking area. And while we do the slow and low noise readout over there, we integrate a new frame in the center. 
this way, we can do with a fully parallel readout 1,000 frames a second with a noise of three to four electrons. The verification was done at a synchrotron in Berlin where we generated monochromatic X-rays of 1.3 keV. They were imaged through a zone blade on a sample or on a detector uh, with the full width half maximum uh, in point spread function of uh, the order of 20 nanometer. We had to displace the detector a little bit more downstream due to mechanical constraints, so we fabricated a new zone plate, and at that point the position, uh, precision of the focus was of the order of seven, 800 uh, nanometer, which is still good enough for our purpose. And then we went with the um, laser, with the uh, X-ray beam across the pixel structure, that is one pixel, three micron per step, so we knew exactly where we injected the uh, X-rays and where the charges were created. And then we applied the algorithms which we developed. And what you can see is that we achieve a position precision better than three micrometer RMS uh, in the center of a pixel. So that again is the pixel size. At the edges, it improves down to 1.3, 1.4 micron. We have experienced different methods of data analysis. For example, taking the seed pixel, so the pixel with the maximum amplitude, and add all the surrounding pixels. So then if we do so and assume the Gaussian correction, we get to that energy and to that position resolution. If we take the seed pixel and apply a one sigma threshold, we get the green light line, and if we take the seed pixel and we simply generate a lookup table and we only select the neighboring pixels which have a chance to have some electrons collected from that, then we improve it again by a little bit. The um, point is that uh, this uh, reconstruction is working very well for a large variety of energies and we have simulated the uh, response of such a system uh, also for uh, different energies starting from 1 keV up to 15 keV. It's not a flat line as one may intuitively assume. No, it's um, a line which is increasing in uh, in, in the point spread function or decreasing in the uh, position precision for the very low energies. And that is due to the fact that you have only a few electrons uh, which contribute to the signal in the neighboring pixel and it's difficult to detect them properly. Then you improve it uh, if you go to higher energies and even at 5 or 6 keV all the electron uh, hole pairs are created in a pretty uh, well-defined distance to the pixel structure so in the 20-30 micron depth so they still have to walk over 420-430 microns so the radius of the charge cloud is pretty well defined. If you go up in energy then uh, the interaction of the photo effect is sometimes very close to the pixel structure structure, sometimes very far away, and you decrease, decrease the positional resolution. If you throw away all the events which have uh, single events, then you throw away those events which are created pretty close to the pixel structure, and then the uh, uh, positional resolution increases again uh, with a constraint that you lose a couple of events, typically of the order of 15%. Now, uh, the same procedure has been applied with a lookup table to determine simultaneously to the energy to, to the position resolution the energy resolution and what came out luckily is that the best energy resolution was obtained if we use uh, the analysis method with a lookup table so taking only a few pixels the most probable pixels if you would take always all the pixels surrounding the seed pixel, you would add noise without adding information to the total amplitude. So the number of readings of a pixel uh, scales uh, the total noise of the measurement. So three by three pixels increase the noise of the cluster by a factor of three. So if you 
can survive and do the measurements with only two by two pixels. So you increase the total noise only by a factor of two. So be very well aware on, on how to do the final composition of your um, uh, pixels, which you would like to take into account. Energy resolution is a difficult topic because it's composed by many different factors. Um, the total uh, uh, energy resolution is composed by a variety of components. The total noise typically expressed in an equivalent noise charge. Uh, that is the charge you have to put at the input of an amplifier to generate the noise signal at the output. is composed by the electronic noise, I will come to that, the ionization statistics in solids, I will come to that as well, and I simply mention additional contributions which I'm not going to work out properly, which is, for example, the noise due to the fact that you may have charge losses during the transfer of a CCD that can be considered as a backward flow loss of electrons and gives rise also to a noise component uh, uh, entitled here uh, CTI noise. So, um, uh, the electronic noise was uh, theoretically described in the early 60s or at the end of the 50s by a couple of, of electronic engineers located in Milan, mainly by uh, uh, Emilio Gatti, Pierfranco Manfredi, and later on carried out again by Velko Radica from Brookhaven National Lab. So the total noise is composed by three major components. There are more than that, but these are the major components present in our systems. The first component is the thermal noise. So the thermal noise has a lot of constants over here and parameters, which I'm not going to stress. But I would like to focus your interest that the thermal noise is proportional to the total input capacitance, so keep that small, and to one over the signal processing time. So if you use a lot of time for the processing of the signal, you can reduce that uh, contribution. And if you can at the same time make your capacitance small, you can make that contribution very small. The one over F noise is proportional to the capacitance as well. Uh, but it's independent of the signal shaping time. That means that uh, independent on whether tau is long or short, this gives some kind of a fixed con uh, contribution over the signal processing time. And the third component is related to the leakage current of the system. In this case, the noise contribution of the parallel shot noise is proportional to the shaping time. So if you make the shaping time long because you want to beat that part over here, you increase the uh, contribution of the shot noise over here. That's why a lot of detector systems are cooled in order to keep the leakage current at a low level and not suffer from a special selection of the uh, signal processing time. So the sum of all of that is in good systems typically of the order of 1.5 to 2 electrons RMS. Now, the Fano noise is uh, something which is a, a very basic physical process. So if you have a monochromatic X-ray, 5.9 keV, which is the energy of uh, manganese K-alpha radioactive source, that well-defined energy does not produce all the time the same amount of electrons and holes in the ionization process. It's always a little bit different. It's 1,620 but sometimes uh, 10 electrons more or less. Where does that come from? So in the ionization process, only 30% of the total energy goes into the production of electron hole pairs, and 70% goes into the production of heat. So simply the detector becomes a little warmer, a little, little bit. Um, so those two competing processes, of course, already lead to uh, let's say, uh, uh, a different uh, production of electron hole pairs. Now, in addition to that, um, the, the width of that distribution, of that fight, thermal against uh, creation of electron hole pairs, is confined by statistical considerations. That means, uh, naively, you could assume that um, this is a Poisson-type process, and that the width of that 
uh, distribution is equal to the square root of the number of electrons you have produced. That's wrong. And you can measure that, in fact, it's much better than that. So the fluctuation is much smaller than predicted by the Poisson distribution. And the reason for that is that the ionization process is not a, an independent process. The, the events are all correlated. And that can easily be understood. Because if you have a 5 keV x-ray, which loses 2 keV in the first go through the ionization of a K shell of the silicon atom, then there are three keV of the residual electron left. It may do, again, maybe a photoelectric effect uh, with the silicon. But if it's done again, then it has only one keV left. At that point, it has a restricted number of possibilities to deposit the energy. And the more it thermalizes, the more restricted are the possibilities of depositing the energy in the silicon. That means that the ionization chain and the thermalization is by far uh, not a non-correlated process. And that is expressed in the Fano factor which uh, makes the distribution much better uh, than the uh, uh, Poisson distribution would predict. So the Fano factor is typically in silicon uh, 0 0.115, uh, although uh, it, uh, it, it means really that it improves the width uh, dramatically. Now, if you take everything together and add the various components to the total noise, and if you plot it, as a function of the energy of the x-rays, you can see you can never achieve an energy resolution better than the black line that is given by quantum mechanics, by the Fano ionization process, which you can calculate from Schrodinger equation. And those who want to try to do that, I can give them the references from Arlick and Struck, and they spent five years to elaborate that properly. So, you can add uh, to that physical boundary, which you cannot beat, the electronic noise, two electrons, if you have a very good system, five or 10. And you will see, for energies above, let's say, five, six, seven keV, the electronic noise does not really contribute very much to the total energy resolution. But it plays a significant role if you go to very low energies. And then you will see that it makes a real difference if you have uh, two, five, or 10 electrons RMS. And it also shows that if the, ener the electronic noise contribution is small, even for very small parts of energy deposits in a sub-pixel resolution scheme, uh, it makes a big difference if you have two or five electrons, because you can then evaluate the Gaussian distribution much finer. And that pays in terms of spatial resolution and energy resolution at the same time. So if somebody asks you, uh, how good is the resolution of your system, don't tell him the pixel size. It has not very much to do with the spatial resolution. Tell him. Uh, what the analysis of the data and the type of radiation and the energy of the radiation tells you. So the pixel size plays a role, but not the only one. Now, I will come to a couple of measurements why that is so important to have good spatial and energy resolution at the same time. Now, let's assume that you have a sample and you would like to know what is the chemical composition of the sample and what, what is its crystalline structure. You would like to know the full truth about uh, the uh, ingredients of the sample plus the maybe uh, uh, lattice orientations and so on. So if you shine with a polychromatic X-ray source on the sample, you get fluorescent light. And that is isotropically shining. So it does not have a preference. But you have other components. If you have a crystalline structure uh, where you have uh, well-defined angles under which certain energies can be uh, diffracted. And they tell you about the lattice spacing and tell you about uh, the, the different layers on top of your sample. Now, if you introduce, if you shine now with your polychromatic uh, X-ray source, a con conventional source on your sample, and if you record x and y and energy, uh, and you plot it in the way shown here in a so-called data cube, then you will see 
that at 6.4 keV, if there is iron in the sample, you have an illumin uh, a flat illumination of fluorescent photons. If you go a little uh, further, uh, for example, at 8.8 .8, uh, keV, uh, then you find only a line which is originating from a diffraction images, image, and that tells you, OK, you have a lattice constant of uh, 6.5 or whatever angstroms, because you know the position of the sample and you know the position of the diffraction image. Now, that can be practically explored. You have an unknown sample, or let's assume that you got it shipped from NIST as a prototype as we got it. Uh, so we knew exactly uh, the, the sample, but we wanted to analyze it with our methods. So it was composed by uh, manganese, uh, mangan, doped uh, platinum, zirconium, uh, titanium, so with various layers and so on. That was the surface of the sample. And if we shine with our molybdenum X-ray source on the sample, we find a forest of lines. So a couple of lines are listed here. These are the fluorescent lines which have to be there uh, because those materials are embedded in the sample. But in addition to that, we have uh, lines around 5.5 keV, around uh, 8 keV, and around 17.5 uh, keV. And they are not fluorescent lines, but they are diffraction photons. And if we shine on the sample and we look only to the 17.5 keV photons, so all the others have been discarded for the uh, analysis, you can see uh, this is the diffraction image uh, which you get if you take the data as they come out of the system. So a pixel has a certain amplitude and that's it. If you do uh, sub-pixel resolution algorithms, which we can do online, and if we zoom now into this tiny area over here and over here, you can see on how the sub-pixel resolution and the good energy resolution helps us. This is the um, um, area uh, with no sub-pixel resolution. You can barely recognize there is less photons here, more photons here, but that's it mainly. If you go to a two by two pixel subpixelation, you already see the shape. Okay, it's somehow curved, and you see some inhomogeneities over here. And if you go to four by four, you already see a lot of inhomogeneities in the sample, lattice imperfections, and so on. So, and that you can do with only one instrument and a very simple instrument. You don't need an XRD mechanism, and you don't need uh, an X-ray fluorescent setup. You can do it with a simple uh, X-ray cube, uh, an X-ray CCD position, and energy resolving, and that's it. Another example for lensless imaging uh, was performed by us, uh, and of course many, many other people, at the Linard Coherent Light Source at SLAC, which is an X-ray free electron laser. So the beam line, uh, the electron accelerator, has been modified in such a way that above, uh, about one half of the accelerator was used to accelerate electrons to a few GeV. Then they were guided in an undulator where they produced coherent X-rays. And uh, they have been guided to an experimental area A and B a for the lower energies and B for the higher energies. The process on how to generate very short X-ray flashes in the annulator is a chapter of itself. But you can imagine that uh, you have uh, electrons undergoing uh, an annulator producing uh, uh, X-rays which are emitted, which are interacting with the electrons which are following the path. And then uh, it finally comes to uh, uh, self amplification of the X-ray intensities. Now, the big question was, uh, OK, if we have an X-ray flash, which may be as short as 10 femtoseconds, which is pretty short, and if that single flash contains, let's say, 10 to 12 or 10 to 13 X-ray photons, a very huge uh, uh, electromagnetic wave is approaching the matter. Now, Let's assume that we have a molecule which we would like to analyze. And let's assume that now the X-ray flash is hitting that object. What is going to happen? So we knew from theoretical 
simulations before, that if the number of x-rays per square angstrom is higher than three, most of the uh, electrons will be stripped of that atom. If that happens, it means that you have a gigantic electron cloud surrounding your object, and the object is positively charged, and it will explode immediately after uh, the interaction was happening. Now, the question was, how short has the pulse to be that the, the X-ray photons hitting the sample may get the diffraction information, leave the sample before it explodes? So and there was a very basic analysis done by Anton Bati at that time early on, and he found out that if the pulses are shorter than 50 femtoseconds, then the scattered photons from the object escape and carry the whole diffraction information, while a couple of femtoseconds later, the sample explodes. If the pulse would be too long uh, and it uh, would hit the exploding atom, of course, you would get no clear uh, information of the interaction at all. Now, Henry Chapman and his team has performed a variety of experiments, and we were happy to share that for a couple of years. So he uh, injected with a liquid jet, mainly a water jet, uh, nanocrystals of 100 nanometer up to one micron into the interaction point with the X-ray laser pulse. So from time to time, a nanocrystal was hit and was producing the diffraction patterns, which you see here. So the typical powder diffraction type rings where you can do the indexing of the whole measurement and the small angle scattering information where you get the size uh, and the shape of your object. Now, if both images are recorded simultaneously, and if you do that hundred thousands of times or maybe even a million of times, uh, then you get enough data to come to a full indexing of your uh, object, which is always hit in different orientations. That's why you need so many hits, because you need to classify them, to bring them in a certain order, and then at the very end of the day, you find out, okay, uh, this image has to come from the orientation of a nanocrystal of that type. Now, if you do all those measurements, and one single shot is shown here, so you can see uh, a BRAC peak over here, you may have uh, hundreds of thousands of photons in the center, then you have some uh, tens or so around, and then it gets less and less. And in the area which is black, you have had no photons at all. And in the areas where it is yellow, you were in an overflow. Uh, and that yellow strip over here was generated through the scattering of the water beam. So that is the Fourier transform of the water beam, nothing else. So no physics associated with that. But uh, all of those patterns have been analyzed in very much detail and finally were then uh, yielding uh, the image which, and the movie which I was showing before. So that is the electron density map uh, from a nanocrystal, uh, photosystem one, being composed by about 200 different constituents uh, and the number of measurements were able to localize and index the whole thing. So the positions were given by the Miller indices of the powder diffraction patterns. And the uh, intensity of the scattering uh, was giving the electron density of the location where they were scattered. So this was helping to analyze uh, this complicated um, uh, nanocrystal, which is the basis of um, transforming optical light into chemical energy in, in organisms, the basis of the photosynthesis. Uh, that was uh, very nicely analyzed here in a detail which was not existing before. Now, uh, biological samples have been uh, used as well, and you can see the CCDs always, the big black thing. There were no photons here, but a lot of scattering information over here. And if you do uh, an algorithm to retranslate the scattering pattern uh, into real space, you can find out the shape of the Mimi virus with a resolution of the order of 10 nanometers. 
Of course, there have been images of the uh, Mimi virus before, but they have been made in a cryo TEM. So they have frozen the object in order to keep it in place and then analyze it with an electron beam. Uh, it was modifying its properties. This was the very first time that it was analyzed uh, without being cooled and modified. Okay, now if you want to go to higher energies, like for example 50 or 100 keV, well then uh, silicon is not the best material to use. This experiment here was made to show how useful it can be to go to the higher energies, not as high as uh, you're going here, but uh, of the order of 100 keV or so. So we were taking a, a, a copper pillar, uh, we put some force, some stress at the end, and we were bending it. And it was the exercise of that analysis uh, to analyze material fatigue and the change of lattice information uh, according to the stress which was put on the uh, copper pillar here. Now in the area where no stress is uh, present, uh, it has some kind of a point-like distribution. So in the area where the stress is very well pronounced over here, you can see that the scattering information of the Miller index 711 and 511 are changing, first of all, uh, their shape and within that shape if you could, would look to the energy resolution you would see lower energies here and higher energies here which means that we have displaced lattice planes with respect to each other and then again if we go to position number six where no stress is uh, uh, present then it returns to uh, a relatively sharp image again now, if you want to go to the higher energies, and if you don't, don't want to wait forever if you do it with silicon only, you better go either to cadmium zinc telluride, and if you are working only with silicon, then you go with a, a, a PNCCD coupled to a scintillator. And what you can see here is uh, the quantum efficiency of a 450 micron thick silicon detector and you can see above 10 keV it goes down to zero very rapidly. Now if we would add a 700 um, micron thick scintillator on top we would already expand the quantum efficiency at uh, 100 keV to 50 percent and if we would add uh, increase it by three millimeter uh, we would uh, have of the order of 50 percent at 200 keV. So adding something with a good light yield and adding something um, which is sufficiently fast in order not to uh, get mixed with subsequent uh, events would help a lot. Now uh, we then took a piece of uh, cesium iodide, uh, put it on a CCD and we illuminated the CCD from this side over here. So the low energy x-rays are stopped in the PN CCD and give rise to the far more limited energy resolution you can get. And the larger energies are stopped in the scintillator cesium iodide and then they produce light and the light can be detected in the same moment in the same frame with the same PN CCD. So the problem which occurred was uh, already mentioned a little bit before. So if you have a high energy x-ray which goes through the silicon and interacts with the, with the cesium iodide over here, it produces a light cone which is pretty large but which has a pretty low amplitude because the light is distributed over a large area. The same x-ray photon may also interact closer to the uh, CCD producing a smaller light cone and a higher amplitude. So it would be difficult to make proper measurements with that. So that's why we changed the scintillator into a columnar scintillator. So these are tiny cesium iodide needles, 10 microns in diameter, many of those nicely grown. Uh, they are covered with a high reflective aluminum substrate so that we, the intensity which we collected in the CCD over here was almost completely independent of the location where the interaction was happening. It was confined to only uh, let's say in one dimension three pixels or four pixels so it was pretty narrow and sharp and the amplitude was uh, significantly higher than in the measurement of the bulk scintillator. 
So if you would look to uh, the response of that, and um, uh, you look to the resolution of the X-rays converted in the cesium iodide scintillator, uh, you would get this kind of information. So it typically has 10% energy resolution at 122 keV, which is not, uh, let's say, the world record, but which is uh, sufficiently good for our purposes. It shows the escape line and uh, the um, uh, K-alpha fluorescence uh, uh, peak, which was giving rise to that. So this energy plus this one should get, give the full energy. And you still see the shoulder of the 136 keV. But all the events which have been converted in the silicon directly with a lower quantum efficiency, but l deliver the Fano limited resolution. And even at uh, 1.5 and 1.7 keV, separated only by 250 eV, we can nicely discriminate silicon from aluminum. So that gives you, with the lower quantum efficiency, the full spectral resolution and uh, with a high quantum efficiency and a lower spectral resolution, uh, but still uh, the things can be separated quite nicely. This is the overall plot which I wanted to mention. So the scintillator signal has a pretty low amplitude. All the scintillating signals are located over here, but they are spread over, let's say, between 20 and 50 pixels. And they are nicely separated from all of the direct converted signals in the silicon directly, which have a spread only of uh, five to six or seven pixels. So they can be nicely separated, and we can exactly tell what kind of signal came from the scintillator and what kind of signal came from the direct conversion in the CCD. Now, the last point. And then I will show you a few, uh, let's say, uh, interesting uh, additional experiments, is the use of direct detection um, instruments for transmission electron microscopes. So up to now, uh, in the old times, the images have been used, have been produced either with uh, scintillators coupled to CCDs with all the problems associated with that, mainly radiation damage and stability, but also um, uh, detection of, uh, proper detection of single electrons. Now, with the new techniques of the direct detection, the field is changing rapidly and dramatically. Now, a transmission electron microscope is a complicated instrument which costs above one and a half million up to maybe six, seven million euros or dollars. Uh, you have a complicated generation of the beam with the help of a, a, a field emission electron gun. You have a lot of complicated optics, but let's assume that we have a beam very well focused hitting a sample. Then you have a large variety of detectors underneath to record the uh, scattered electrons. So you have the so-called bright field detector, which covers an area uh, with a diameter of typically 10 millirad. You have the annular dark field detector, which is surrounding that detector, uh, which is covering from 10 millirad to 50 millirad. And you have the high angle annular dark field detector surrounding again above uh, 50 millirad uh, uh, scattered electrons. And then you may have additionally uh, X-ray detectors, which are collecting the X-ray fluorescence uh, uh, signals, uh, and this is only a small part of the detectors which are implemented. It's a very, very busy and compact uh, uh, mounting. So um, if you then take um, a direct detection uh, system, you can do things which you were unable to do before, and that's why I'm mentioning that. So since a few years, when um, those detectors became available, people invented a new name called four-dimensional stem imaging. Four-dimensional means. So you have your probe and your sample, and you have your electron beam, and you scan the sample in two dimensions. Then, in the old times, you were only 
getting the signal, the integral signal of the electrons falling on the bright field detector. Now the bright field detector is a pixelated detector, so it adds another two dimensions to the measurements because the uh, information of the electrons is not homogeneously distributed over the bright field, but it has intensity fluctuations, and I'll come to that in a second. Now, um, if you uh, would look only to the bright field, you would see a disk of that type. So that point illuminated with a few square angstroms from the electron point is producing a bigger picture over here, depending on the distance and other parameters. And what you were assuming before is that this distribution is homogeneous, but it's by far not homogeneous. You can see higher intensities, lower intensities, and that is due to diffraction in the sample. So you get the full phase information if you collect the full image, because you see interference, positive and negative, in the various locations. That is exploited, exploited by the technologies which are called typography, and they make use of the phase information by overlapping the disks in such a way that the next exposure is made here so that you can correlate the phases of the neighboring spot with the one of the previous one. And if you do so, you gain a new dimension in resolution. And uh, that's what I want to show you, but before, I would like to introduce you very briefly into the simulation of electron tracks. A 20 keV electron produces a very tiny spot. So the distribution of the electrons on the pixel structure, this is the pixel structure of 48 by 48 microns, is shown here. So the spread is of the order of two, three microns uh, in, in diameter. In the depth of the silicon, you can see it's of the order of uh, this is a six microns, so the, the RMS of that is maybe three or, or four microns only. So it happens very close to the surface, and the spot is pretty well pronounced. If you go to 60 keV, the tracks already get longer, and the radius here increases dramatically. And if you go to even higher energies, you will see that uh, you have long tracks uh, which are all starting here where they hit the silicon, but they are ending somewhere. And now you have to think, what can I do with that? So you can see you get a wide distribution of information from a 300 keV electron. Now, if you take a picture of 20 keV electrons, you see mainly single pixel events, a few times split events, and maybe even three pixels are hit. If the information was deposited pretty close to the borders. But with the 300 keV, you see, you always see those long tracks, which I was already indicating before. But those long tracks have a special signature, which you can see here. So they have a low ionization density in the very beginning, and when they are stopped, they are ionizing pretty hard. So we know that the entry point was here, that the stopping point was here. That can be used as the information to reconstruct the point of incidence more precisely than a pixel, although 12 or more pixels have been uh, affected by the charge cloud which was produced by the electrons. So if you go through that exercise, you will find out you can nicely, so this is a plot summarizing the, uh, let's say, electrons which have been detected in one shot. Uh, you may have one electron hitting the uh, uh, PNCCD. You may have more than one, so two, three, four. So you can separate every individual electron from the other one. And that is true for 120 keV, for 80 keV, and even for 300 keV. And here you see again uh, how it helps if you then apply all the methods of uh, sub-pixel resolution, which I was introducing before. So that exercise was um, elaborated very deeply and is used also in experiments. And I'm showing you two or three experiments where that was helping to improve precision tremendously. Application number one is the analysis of magnetic fields in the sample. So it's also uh, called um, uh, 
Lorentz imaging or Lorentz 10. So you have a sample and you shine on it with the electron beam and you map the electron beam across the sample and the disk is displaced as a function of the magnetic field. So the electrons are deviated and if you can very precisely monitor the displacement, you can measure as a function of the position very precisely the magnetic field and uh, uh, achieve a deep insight into the uh, boundaries of phases of materials and also on how the magnetic fields develop in the various uh, chemical uh, components of the sample. So that would not have been possible without the additional uh, subpixelation. This is uh, a graphene image. That is just a propaganda plot which was uh, made by the company Geol who uh, was using our detector system. That is a typical uh, annular dark field image of uh, graphene. If you use the phase information as explained before, uh, you get a much clearer uh, image. And if you do a cut, for example, through this area here and here, you can see very nicely on how the um, uh, information, the uh, accuracy of the measurement was improved. Last experiment, which I like a lot, from the X-ray, uh, fr from the uh, transmission electron microscopes as shown here. And that was an analysis which was done by Hao Yang, uh, who used our uh, CCD for um, the analysis of the uh, development of new drugs. And the concept was the following. Let's assume that we have a double-walled carbon nanotube, which is shown here. And uh, this carbon nanotube uh, sh should be filled with a certain type of drugs. On top of the nanotube, you should have a plug, an enclosure uh, made by a big fullerene component. And attached to that fullerene component, you have so-called functionalized tethers, uh, which are uh, um, uh, um, components which are attaching to special cells, selectively to cells or to proteins. And once they attach there, they should remove the fullerene over here. Sorry for that. They should remove the fullerene over here and the drug should leave the double walled carbon nanotube. Now, the analysis shown here, that was the image which was obtained with the annular dark field. You can see the high Z contrast of the markers which have been introduced, that was iodine. Uh, but in the face image, you see the double wall of the carbon nanotube, and inside you see that fullerenes have been uh, migrated into. So uh, the plug was not working correctly and was dissolving at the end, so that at the very end, the drug was somehow not present anymore in the uh, double-walled uh, carbon nanotube, and the fullerenes uh, were moving in this direction. So this was demonstrating the failure of the development of an, uh, a drug development, which was very important for the people because now they can work on a different mechanism on how to close the carbon nanotube. At the very end, a few examples from X-ray astronomy, which I like a lot because it's a mixture of uh, imagination, fantasy, and so on. So uh, that's why I think it's so also attractive in, in, in the population. Um, you have optical astronomy, you have X-ray astronomy, you have uh, infrared astronomy, you have gamma astronomy. So all kinds of wavelengths are associated with that. And in the last days, we have learned that we have gravitational astronomy, which is popping up. So uh, the field is expanding, and uh, yeah, it's developing quite rapidly. Now, the uh, satellites which are able to monitor and to measure precisely the emission of X-rays from all the objects surrounding us are so-called X-ray satellites, which are carrying X-ray optics, which are uh, Volta-type X-ray optics, grazing incidence optics. So X-rays are hitting the wall, are reflected once and twice, and then they are focused on a detector plane, which is located here. 
Now, if you uh, do that with a lot of shells nested into each other, you can get a decent collecting area and do imaging and spectroscopy and time evolution of the object in the sky. So the, for the very first time, this kind of uh, PN junction CCD was used. Uh, it had a size of six by six centimeter, fabricated on a four inch wafer. At that time, that was in 1999, that was the largest uh, X-ray CCD ever produced. And that is in the focal plane of the XMM satellite. Now, an image, for example, from a supernova remnant called uh, Tycho, discovered in 1532 in the optical by Tycho Brahe, that was a Czech astronomer, uh, is shown here. So first of all, you see the object as such. You see the shape. But from every individual photon composing that image, we know the energy, we know the arrival time, and we know, of course, its position. And if we plot that, for example, here, so we see on one side the decay with increasing energy gives us the temperature of the object and that is of the order of a million degree if you evaluate the slope correctly. But you see a lot of abundances as well, like oxygen, iron, neon, magnesium, sulfur, argon, calcium, and iron. Now, if you want to learn about the dynamics of that object, you need to decompose that, and you want to know where does the magnesium radiation come from, where does the silicon radiation come from, and the iron, and so on. And if you take all that into account, you can learn about the dyna dynamics of the explosion. Then you will see that the lighter ele uh, elements are at the outer rim of the explosion, while the heavier elements like uh, iron, for example, are more located in the center. Um, another very nice measurement. That's not the measurement, that's the simulation. So that is a black hole located here. You've never seen such a black hole before, I guess. Uh, it's surrounded by an accretion disk. It's a disk of matter spinning around the black hole. And the uh, components of the disks, uh, which are close to the event horizon of the black hole, are falling uh, at the very end into the black hole and disappear. But the radiation which is generated at the rim of uh, that accretion disk uh, is, of course, significant and is uh, emitting uh, a gigantic flux of x-rays. Now, if you would have an iron atom belt around here, uh, and that is uh, something, so a lot of uh, uh, particles here are iron atoms, uh, you would not get a monochromatic line, which we see if we would observe it from here, but you would see a line somehow which is broadened. And it's broadened due to the fact that we have a Doppler shift in the red, we have a Doppler shift in the blue, so we have a shift towards the lower and higher energies, and in addition to that, we have a gravitational redshift. Now, people were trying to measure such spectra uh, for a long, long time, and it was uh, successfully performed the first time in 2007 with the XMM satellite. And you can see that was the iron line at 6.4 keV. You see the broadening over here. The statistics is not yet as good as you would like to have it, but that was a very clear indication for people that they are looking to an object and they could calculate the mass of the object and they could calculate the spin of the accretion disk. Last thing, because that is reminding me to Hollywood, uh, is what the astronomer called a cosmic thunderstorm. So two cluster of galaxies, not two individual galaxies, but two cluster of galaxies. And every cluster is containing more than uh, 10,000 galaxies, and they are colliding. And while they collide, they produce a gigantic uh, wave of uh, x-rays due to the fact that the temperature increase during the explosion is so enormous that it's emitting from uh, a few EV, so in the optical, up to uh, several tens of keV, which is 100 million degree hot. And you can see uh, also the shock waves on how they develop and so on. So what was measured is the picture over here. 
So that you see this kind of shock wave. The holes over here are stars and objects which have been in the light of sight and they have to be taken out in order not to uh, deform the overall picture. Now what you can see is uh, that this is a temperature distribution which can be explained if you have such colliding uh, uh, clusters of galaxies. Now, have they been observing that just in the right moment when the interaction happened? No. So the process of collision was lasting 200 million years. So that is a process which already started a long time ago. And the distance of the object to the Earth is about uh, 700 million light years. So um, the uh, state of the thunderstorm is roughly now. So that was roughly the situation. They were trying to model that uh, with their programs in such a way uh, that they can re, uh, that they can explain the heat distribution they finally measured. It's uh, a nice model. I think it was confirmed by additional measurements later on, uh, but um, uh, I think um, people are making progress because the number of observations is uh, growing rapidly. Okay, I wanted to show you uh, during that talk that developing an instrument is not only to do soldering of electronics or to uh, be busy with vacuum systems or so, but it's also, let's say, a direct involvement in the science. And you can only make good instruments if you understand precisely what the physicists want to measure and how to optimize systems. So you have to know, can I sacrifice a little bit of this parameter in order to gain in the other parameter? And that is an important point because uh, you have to know whether uh, the uh, property of dynamic range is more important than the property of resolution or the property of speed. But they all are combined, so you have to know exactly what people want to have in order to perform the science so that you can make the instrument exactly uh, suited for that experiment. Yes, and that's why um, the development of instrumentation is as important as doing the scientific measurement itself. That's, uh, I think, uh, an interesting point, which also brought Glenn to us, saying the use of a scientific instrument is as uh, well science as using a scientific instrument. So uh, both are correlated and both are equally important. So I wanted to show here, and that is just a small aspect of our work, that silicon detectors are able to efficiently measure position energy of X-rays simultaneously in a wide energy range. Um, and uh, we can do the same with electrons from low energies up to higher energies. The choice of pixel size is essential for energy resolution, for position resolution, highest frame rate, and also dynamic range. So uh, with just to give you a take home message, even if the pixel size is relatively large, you can do an imager with a decent number of pixels if you read it out with extremely low noise, which has a number of resolution points which is exceeding those of your CMOS camera. Um, at the very end, I would like to show you a picture which was taken by Gladys. I think it was in 2009 in Santa Rosa uh, when we visited you. And we would like to thank Glenn again for his contributions to the science of instrumentation for his way of teaching instrumentation, which is important, and I think he has left traces in that, for taking over risk and responsibility, which is not always the case, um, for being a wise advisor and for having a clear compass, for his leadership and his constant interest in our developments, and of course, for his friendship. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>